Mats Mikkelsen. Uh, you were supposed to be on this side now, so I can see when our time is out. <laughs> uh, welcome into Iceland. Thank. The classical question: How do you like Iceland? I love Iceland. When we were here earlier today, you didn't wear this sweater. You went, you used the break to get a new sweater. Yeah, uh, 56 degrees north. It's fantastic. <laughs> I was wearing uh, five layers this morning, and now I'm only wearing one. I'm not cold at all. Uh, this movie, The Royal Affair, uh, that all these people have been viewing, and you're now here in front of them in, in modern clothes. But this is uh, like a huge historical saga from uh, Denmark. Is this something, this story about uh, this Dr. Swansea and the uh, queen he gets, they fall in love, is this that everybody in Denmark know and learn in school? Yeah, it's, it's not really a saga, because it's a true story. <laughs> That's a big difference. Uh, well, I think that my generation might have been the last one that learned about it. Uh, we did not necessarily learn it in school, but we knew about it. It was part of our history package. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's, always been, it's, it's a crown jewel of, of Danish history in many ways. And, and uh, we thought it was about time that uh, we told the story, because it's not only about Luckily for film, there is a, there is a romantic uh, angle on the film, which was a true story. And there was also a romantic angle between the, the king and the doctor, uh, at least in a friendship way. Uh, and it also it was in the midst of uh, when Europe was changing. And we were, strangely enough, and probably because of this doctor, Dr. Stolzer, we did not go through a revolu revolution because he, he took the air out of the balloon he did it before the revolution. Even though everything went back to normal, he started something that, that uh, changed Denmark forever. And it's, uh, yeah, the age of information. That's where everything is starting to change, when the, where the king uh, and the queens up till then, they had been like uh, the sons and daughters of gods. You know, they, they could do nothing wrong. And then kind of the, the so, what, what do you think about, sorry if I've put you in the spot here, what do you think about the royal family today? And, uh, <laughs> and the role of, of uh, the royal families all over? Well, uh, all over is a different question. The Danish one has been smart enough, uh, as you can tell. They've always been one step ahead of being uh, decapitated. You know? um, <laughs> they, did what the, they, they were listening to the people. Uh, and, and for that reason, they're still around. And I, I have a great admiration of, of the royal family, even though I grew up as an extreme lefty communist world <laughs> when you were co from Copenhagen in the 70s and 60s. Uh, I think they're doing a tremendous job. Whatever people say, however much we pay them to work, they give 10 times as much back to the country somehow. So in, the, in pure economics, I'm happy. They have no power political. And I think they are very, very uh, intelligent and, and lovely people. I met quite a few of them. Uh, in terms of other royalties, it uh, could be a different case. <laughs> <laughs> OK, say no more. Uh, we're going to throw out here to the audience if you want to ask him uh, questions. So we have a microphone here, yeah? Uh, here in the front row, if the microphone can come here. here. here oh, OK, there, sorry. First there in the sixth or seventh row. Hi again. I asked you yesterday two questions and a request. Yeah, I had three requests and one question. Yes. Uh, now I have one request and then one question. <coughs> Shoot. Can I have a picture with you afterwards, please? <laughs> yes. The question is, was it uncomfortable wearing these sort of clothes? Because I've heard from other actors wearing similar clothing that they had to have a corset. No, Did I mean... you have to have that one? A cold set. A corset. A corset, no, we didn't know. Lucky you. I'm, I'm good. Uh, no, it wasn't. I mean, I mean, to be honest, if we had to be really true to the story, uh, I had to be on the wrong side of 300 pounds. That's how big he was. And she was as well. But we thought that we didn't want to spend two hours looking at people kissing each other looking like that. So, so they chose me and Alicia for that instead. Uh, no, the clothing was, uh, I mean, if we were not wearing it, it would be really weird, you know, uh, to be honest. Uh, the, the good thing is that somebody else is doing it as well. If I was all alone wearing that, weird. Uh, 
But I mean, yeah, I had some reluctancy because you have, um, you know, the, the, the men have like uh, from here and down there wearing stockings, right? Which we don't often do. And I have what I call serious chicken legs. So I was like very concerned about how we're going to pull this off. Uh, but they filled me a lot from here and up, so that's all good. Uh, when you are playing modern characters and when you are playing historical characters like in A Royal Affair or Michael Kohlhaas, uh, do you have a different approach to acting or is it the same kind of approach to playing a man? Yes, I mean, you almost answered the question by saying playing a man. I, I mean, yes, I, I play this man and, and obviously if we wanted to do this completely correct, we would not have been speaking Danish. They would probably have been speaking French or German at the court. Uh, so we changed it into Danish. Uh, the princess or, the, or the, the Vikander, Alicia Vikander was Swedish and she, she plays English in the, in the film and she had to learn Danish. But in reality, they would have been speaking French, probably in the English court as well. Um, so that is one thing. And obviously, there was a lot of, um, um, what's the name of that? And there's, there's a certain courtesy in the period. There's a certain courtesy that we try to give life to, to a degree. But if we went all the way with that courtesy, we might have been distancing ourselves from a modern day audience. So it's all a fine balance between finding a way to tell this story that we can relate to today and not throw it so far away that people go, that is so weird, everything is so weird. So we, we're taking the emotions serious, which they did as well. I'm sure then if you fell in love 200 years ago, you were in love. Um, we found, or we did not find, there are quite a number of, of letters between Strunz and, uh, and uh, the Queen uh, that are heartbreaking, beautiful. It was not... There was a lot of political alliances in these days where people got married or had affairs to, to, to strengthen the politics. But they were just purely in love. It's heartbreaking to read these letters. And, then, and it's even more heartbreaking to read the letters between the king and, and Strunze because they loved each other. And he was a simple-minded person. He was a kid. But there was a mutual respect that was really, really fantastic. So to answer your question, I approach it with the dignity that the script indicates. But I try to bring it up to a world that we can relate to. Okay, here we have a question. <coughs> Hi, uh, your character has a lot of success uh, by whispering in the ears of powerful people. But also it ultimately leads to your character's death. If there yes. was one point in the story that you've told here that you could whisper in your own ear, what, when would it have been and what might you have said? That would be like 10 times a day. <laughs> um, and and if, I, if I could actually answer the question, I'm sure I wouldn't do it publicly. Right? Um, but but to, to skip over the question and, 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 and refer to what you just said, I, I think you, are, you have a point that um, I don't think anyone is in doubt that, that what Strunzi was doing was a great thing. It was a great thing, uh, but not at the time. And that's the reason in the history books he's hardly there. And if he's there, he is a villain. He's a, he's a bad guy. Uh, much later on in history, he, they, they realized what he did, and they gave us a small, insignificant street and named it after him in Copenhagen. Uh, and, but um, you're right, Corru uh, power corrupts. And, and even though he wants to do the right thing, I mean, the, the people are not even whispering in the, in the king's ear when he, when he comes to the court. They're screaming in his ear just telling him what to do. And all of a sudden he's like, so what, what if I whispered? What if I whisper something that's better? And he starts whispering and he whispers more and more. And eventually he whispers so more that he becomes corrupt. And whatever he gave the people is his downfall. Uh, and it's an interesting lesson from, from history. I think it's repeating itself unfortunately again and again. Uh, right, so I was wondering, um, in terms of rehearsal with the other actors, like, um, was there a different approach for different relationships between the different characters? Like, for example, uh, the king and Strunze, and, uh, or the queen and Strunze? Yeah, in, 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 uh, it's, it's rare in the film world that we do a lot of rehearsals. We, the rehearsals are often before we start shooting, sitting down, talking through the script, 
being on the same page, agreeing on what it is. We might meet in the morning and do small rehearsals, uh, but we already discussed it a long time ago. Uh, but it was a little different in this situation. Uh, the, the King's character was uh, quite challenging because we knew from different versions of, of reading, well, whoever writes history is apparently the, the one who's right. But then there's somebody else writing it and he's saying something else. So we were not there, we don't have any footage of it. But it, it strongly indicated that he would suffer for something that we will, we have a diagnosis today that people would call it, but we were not sure. So we wanted to balance it between start raving mad or just being childish. So we always did two, two takes of whatever he did. One that was like where he's losing it and one where he's just 13 years old. And, and, and then later on, we, the director could balance it in the editing, right? So, but that was quite interesting for the rest of us. <laughs> Some of the days we, we were just actually having an in, interaction with him and other days it was just like, oh, I, I, might, I don't have to be in the scene, he's <laughs> just going ballistic, you know. And, and, but that was necessary, it's a necessity to do, and it was a quite a big challenge for this young actor, his first film job, uh, and he pulled it off amazingly. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, I was wondering, is there any uh, scene in the movie that you wish uh, uh, you could have done better, or an extra scene that was cut out of the movie that you wish could have stayed in? I don't think I... <laughs> yeah, low-hanging fruit there. Uh, there's always something you can do better. There's always something that you look at it, and if I, if I take it like separately out, yes. A very good in, uh, indicator of, of that it's working is that if you start relaxing the first time you see the film and you're in it, something is right. You know, it's, it, something is working. And then you don't pay attention to the details because something overall is right. Uh, but if, if you keep looking, it's like looking at a ballet. If you keep looking at the feet of the ballerina, there's generally something wrong. If, if, if it's working up here, you wouldn't look at the feet. Right? And, and so, so I, I had a good feeling when I watched the film. But if I look at scene for scene, I'm sure I can find stuff. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of the film. I think it was a, a difficult film to make. Obviously, when you make a film and nobody has been there in, in, 17, in the 70s, nobody was there. And, and the second you release a film like this, 200,000 people in Denmark are specialists. They were there. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's the problem with a film like that. When I've done a film about the Second World War, about the resistance as well, it was the same situation. Even though we were the ones who had more information than any historian, every single person in, in, in Denmark knew more than us. Right? And that is just what we have to face. But, but again, we're not trying to make a history lesson. We're trying to make, be inspired by history and make a film that we can relate to. And we, we have to stick to that and not say we're teaching people history, even though it's very close to what happened. Okay, and the final question here. Hi, hi. Um, I was just wondering, it might be rather a personal question. Um, I was just wondering, how do you see the concept of like Danish Hugge? Hugge. Hugge, yeah. Hugge. How can you like, do you have any room for enjoying this in your life? Well, that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> um, where, where, where are you? I can't see you because of the light. Can you raise your hand? There you go, yeah. Um, it, uh, well, I, I, I think that the, I think that a lot of people try to, um, to define Hugo. Uh, and every time they do it, it's all wrong. And, and when we do it, it's all wrong. It's something, we know exactly what it is when we do it, but it's very difficult to define. It's not something that is, it's something you do. And, it's, and it's, sometimes it's actually something you absolutely don't do, and it's Hugo. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's very hard to define. Uh, do you have your Do I have the secret? No, I, I think you know exactly when you're hooting yourself, when you're doing it. <laughs> okay, uh, Mats Mikkelsen, thank you very much. <laughs>